the very idea of preservation accepts the continuation of capitalist extraction, the continuation of damage. It is arguing that the only solution is to enclose and protect certain areas. And so then you're dividing the world Mm -hmm. into protected areas, cherished areas, and then sacrifice areas. The promise of restoration is that restoration can happen everywhere. It is taking action. It is intervening. It is an act of caring. It is an act of nurturing non-human life. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Laura Martin. Laura is an environmental historian and an assistant professor of environmental studies at Williams College. Laura is also the author of the extraordinary book Wild by Design, The Rise of Ecological Restoration. And join me today to discuss this topic. This is a wonderful conversation. I so enjoyed speaking with Laura. We start off by looking at the link between the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis and policy, with Laura offering the frame that it is political policies which cause these crises, not just the abstract notions of neoliberalism, fossil fueled capitalism and industrialization. She says that environmental policies offer us alternatives to our present. So what are the ones that we can use to build a world that protects both ourselves and the species with whom we share this planet. We then go on to discuss preservation and conservation, the policies which are typically offered to protect nature, but which have very problematic historical precedents, often dispossess indigenous peoples of their land, and fulfill the same problematic dichotomy that somehow humankind is separate from nature. Laura then goes on to explore the possibility of restoration, that rather than there being this binary of land that we protect and land that we sacrifice. Restoration is the collaboration with other species, humanity doing the labor to restore species to our environments, whether that be on the roof of a building, on a wetland, in a forest, in suburbia. She explains her restoration as a policy that combats the implied assumption in preservation that we can continue fossil fueled capitalism until we run out of those fuels, saying that rather than taking action to offset our harm, we take action to care for the world around us. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Laura, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Rachel. My first question for you is, why is the world in crisis? It's a, that's a big question. It's a big question. I worked on the, the, um, the twinned biodiversity and climate crises. Um, and the world is in these crises for many intertwined reasons. Um, To start with just one um, small example, focusing on just one species, but one that I think speaks to the ways that all of these planetary crises are interlocked. Um, The other day in my undergraduate class on environmental history, I taught a book by the historian Nancy Langston um, on how different migratory species are facing the climate crisis. Um, So if we look at Her example of caribou. So caribou are a migratory species of deer um, that have a circumpolar distribution. So a distribution that crosses many political uh, lines, 
The challenges that caribou face include industrial logging, which is disrupting their food supplies, the expansion of white-tailed deer into their uh, habitat, and white-tailed deer are vectors of a parasitic brain worm that doesn't really affect the white-tailed deer, oh, but devastates caribou <laughs> populations. Um, and white-tailed deer are themselves increasing because of policies um, in the United States and Canada that lead to habitat fragmentation, um, which deer can, can cope with better than caribou. Um, caribou are facing the draining, massive draining of swamplands um, by initially beginning in the 19th century by white settler colonists in North America and continuing into the present. Just this um, summer, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, in a decision, Sackett versus EPA, um, it restricted the legal definition of wetland, making many um, bogs and seasonal wetlands no longer protected under federal law. And so there's going to be an increased um, uh, increased filling and, and impacts to wetlands. Um, so that, you know, impact is on caribou is just going to get worse. Um, then there's climate change. Climate change is leading to harder ice, which makes it more difficult for caribou to paw through and get to their food, which is lichen on the ground. Um, there's lice, um, less ice cover on lakes, um, and that makes it difficult for caribou to escape their predators, including wolves, because they're often they got trapped on islands. Um, and then on top of that, there's persistent pollutants, um, both plastics, heavy metals, pesticides um, that bioaccumulate and are stored in fatty tissues. And so all of these different crises are impacting the bodies and communities of caribou. And then this crisis for caribou is also a crisis for the many people that share their lives with caribou, um, including the, the Sami of Finland, uh, the Ojibwe, um, in um, what is now um, Minnesota and the Great Plains in the United States. So we could say that settler colonialism caused these crises. We could say that the burning of fossil fuels caused these crises. We could say that <laughs> the Western assertion of that humans are outside of nature and separate from nature caused these crises. But I think it's crucial that we think about the ways in which particular political decisions caused these crises. Um, you know, settler, settler colonialism, capitalism, environmental extraction, um, a world in which few people know where their food comes from or the names of the different tree species that are outside of their windows. Um, these were not inevitable processes and outcomes. Um, they were choices by those who consolidated power and continue to consolidate power. Um, so I so I feel that, you know, this is where my field, environmental history, really intervenes and thinks about um, what, what were the alternatives to our present and how can we learn from the past to think about how to live differently in the future and, um, you know, I, I've, I've moved away in my work. I, I teach about the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, and crisis is a word I use often in class. But I, I'm kind of moving away from, there is a way in which, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this too, that the way in which the narrative of a crisis is disempowering. Hmm. The, cri the idea that um, crisis kind of implies this overwhelming inevitable, powerful process. Um, and if we accept crisis and we accept doom, then we could ask, you know, what is the, the point of investing in repair or mm. trying to think of different ways of living? Um, so in my own work, I um, in thinking about, you know, what can we do about the twinned biodiversity crisis and climate crisis um, I work on ecological restoration. So the idea of where um, individuals, scientists, um, volunteers, 
nonprofits, increasingly governments and corporations are looking to try and undo some of the harms caused by things like industrial extraction, settler colonialism, um, industrialization. And um, I define, I uh, published a book last year, Wild by Design, The Rise of Ecological Restoration. And I define restoration as an attempt to undo human-caused ecological damage by collaborating with non-human species. Hmm. Um, And here I think the idea of collaboration is really key and it's what distinguishes restoration from other modes of environmental management. Um, You know, I think one mode of environmental management that's really popular globally right now and is getting a lot of momentum in negotiations in the UN is preservation. The idea of setting aside land, extracting land from human economies either actually physically fencing it off or legally fencing it off um, from use. And um, as many indigenous activists and scholars have pointed out, what this often means is kicking people out of their homes and homelands um, in the name of biodiversity preservation. So in my work, I argue that um, in trying to undo ecological harms to non-human species, we also need to think about how those same projects can undo historic harms to human communities and the ways in which biodiversity restoration and social justice can be brought together under the same projects um, to do some of um, the same work. Oh, Laura, I could just sit and listen to you. (laughs) I feel like I'm in just this wonderful private lecture. I've taken so many notes. That was all so clear. Gosh, thank you so much. There is so much of this I want to dig into. Um, And I actually don't know where to start because I'm too excited. Um, Let's let's do a couple of bookmarks. So, So some things to hit. I think the 30 by 30 uh, mm. with this preservation um, and Survival International sort of did a campaign against this, warning against, you know, trying to possess 30, bookmark 30% of the um, Earth's landmass for preservation and conservation. Let's do that. Um, some of these environment like alternatives to the present, like policies in the past that took us one way rather than another, if you have any examples of that. Um, and then... This thing of crisis, this narrative of crisis. Let me just respond to that. It is such an important question. And I think like everything, um, the resilience with which, the the diversity with which we can respond to such a question allows for our resilience. So I find the language of crisis quite helpful because I'm quite good in a crisis. Um, and I'm a, I'm a fighter, not a lover type thing. (laughs) Um, and I like urgency Uh and under a deadline or under danger. And these things I've experienced through my life, I find that I can really step up to meet it. I know that not everybody is like me. I'm very glad that not everybody is like me. Some people have better regulated nervous systems, (laughs) quite frankly. Um, So it's very important that you have a kind of like section of the population that do respond well to that and a section of the population that are working on these other narratives that better suit what it is to be building and nurturing and creating and doing all of the work that lays the foundations for what comes after crisis. It's Mm -hmm. like having your warrior class and then the people who actually keep society going or rebuilding afterwards, essentially. Um, So I know me and some people who don't find it disempowering, find it actually kind of like, like putting a spotlight on the moment and being like, let's go, let's figure this out. But for a lot of people, especially those who are kind of like inundated with the narrative, but aren't in the space to do the work to try and help it is incredibly disempowering. Yeah, and I I appreciate that perspective. And I I see both sides Mm. to this. Um, The the way in which 
a crisis of narrative, a, a, a narrative of crisis leads to this urgency, as you said, and a call to action for many people. And I do also find that appealing, right? And I, in my work too, am putting out a call to action, a call for people to do the work and the, the, the caring work of attending to the lives of other species mm. and prioritizing not only human life, but other, other life as well. But there is this flip side to it where the urgency the urgency is both a, a call to action and saying like we've spent enough time kind of analyzing this, we need to actually take action. And th- this is where I think restoration is really um, holds a lot of promise because restoration is doing something, is intervening mm-hmm. in a landscape rather than just sitting back and hoping that nature will be able to repair itself. Um, but that urgency also comes with, I think, I, I think where I started to to question my relationship to this narrative of crisis was was through teaching, and it was through teaching an introductory environmental science um, and studies class where a lot of the students, this was before the pandemic, which I think is important, a lot of the students um, landed upon the idea that the solution to the climate crisis, I'm laughing, but it's not funny, that the solution to the climate crisis would be a benevolent dictator. Yes. yes. <laughs> was because no one's acting Mm -hmm. the best way to achieve prompt action is to consolidate power and to put all the power in one person's hand who cares about climate change Mm -hmm. right and that um kind of anti-democratic impulse the idea that what is needed is speed and Mm -hmm. efficiency i think i think that's the piece it's the temper it's the the speed part of yeah the call to action that um, concerns me. And so I've been thinking recently about, you know, how, what would it mean to put out a call to action to respond to the biodiversity crisis, to respond to the climate crisis, um, but that one, one that's taking a, a slower approach. Totally. If we think about, it takes thousands of years for peatlands to develop. So you cannot restore a peatland in two years. Um, even though funding cycles for environmental projects might be two to five years to grow a tree. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite restoration examples is um, uh, scientists that are working at the University of Melbourne in Australia, trying to restore uh, the powerful owl, which is a, I love the name of that species. (laughs) Uh, I'm forgetting the, the Latin name, but this is an owl species that, only nests in tree cavities of large trees. And so for a tree to a lot, and a lot of large trees have been um, taken down in cities and suburbs in Eastern Australia. So the only way to create new habitat for um, powerful owls would be to plant trees and then wait 200 to 500 years for the trees to be big enough to, um, for owls to nest in. And so there's designers and scientists um, at the University of Melbourne right now that are designing owl boxes modeled off of tree cavities to be a bridge solution or a temporary solution to hopefully attract owls and enable them to live in these cities and suburbs until the planted trees are big enough to support the owls. And so... Yeah. And so I, I think there's the um, a lot of the crises that have impacted species, the you know, long list of, of, of processes, political processes, economic processes that have caused caribou decline, for mm-hmm. example, um, happened over a relatively short time period on the order of decades. Um, whereas restoration is going to need to happen on the order of centuries, and so how do we how do we deal with that um, kind of temporal yeah. mismatch? I think the thing with which we need to be urgent is the stopping the stopping of harmful activity, 
uh-huh. and the building of the rest is 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 going to take time. It's 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 a long term inter generational multi species collaboration, as you say. And you know, I've got this amazing friend, Paddy Loman. He's a strategist and like a narrative, um, a narrative strategist. And he was working with this. I think it was the UK government that branded this campaign of like race to zero, race to net zero. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, hang on." If you're heading towards a brick wall, you don't accelerate, you hit the brakes. Like that, this needs to be the framing, not that we're ramping up everything in order to get there. We need to be slowing down and contracting and doing less, like much less of the harmful stuff, more of the good stuff. But overall, less, less. we need to be doing less. And I think that's um, such an important way of thinking about like harm reduction as well and to, uh-huh. to stop being um kind of co-opted by this sense of urgency that is now seeing like billions of dollars being thrown around the world with with no real good solution on offer certainly the solutions that are on offer to the financial markets that they want to respond to um because they want things fast because they deal like they live in like quarterly time frames rather than 200 300 400 500 year time spans which is what we were talking about if we're talking about restoring. So let's let's get into it and let's keep this framing of this like multi-species collaboration, which I think is so important. Um, restoration, it's not something I've uh, discussed a lot on the show. I am really, really interested in it because I think where I come from with my investigation into climate corruption, I'm always very suspicious of like anything that's like, oh, we're going to help nature yeah. because everything that I've investigated so far is deeply harmful. Um, so to get there, can, can we keep digging into this difference between like preservation and restoration and talk about this 30 by 30 campaign, mm-hmm. which was led by, I can't remember if it came out of a cop, but it, it's definitely like a, a, a centralized governmental campaign. 30% of the world's landmass should be reserved purely for nature by 2030 and human rights and indigenous rights and nature rights campaigners all over the world went, whoa, <laughs> that's a that's a land grab. Yeah, and and it is a land grab and it's it it is proceeding apace. So it the 30 by 30 idea is it has a few different um origin points. Um one of them being the work of the late conservation biologist E.O. Wilson, who um put out a book before his death arguing for setting aside 50% of the world in protected biodiversity reserves. The book does not mention where this would happen and who would be displaced, as many um, you know, anthropologists and sociologists quickly pointed out. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, a number of different influential environmental NGOs kind of picked up on this idea of conserving and preserving 30% of land by 2030. Um, This was an idea that was then introduced to the United Nations. Um, It has has gained a ton of traction both um, within governments and uh, within the United Nations and then also within private corporations as well. Shocking. Um, It's it's a big kind of fundraising campaign, and it has had direct influence on both legislation and policy. So within the United States, the Biden administration has through um, through executive statements, not through legislation, has committed to a 30 by 30 plan. Um, and the Department of, of the Interior is working on a vague sketch of what that would look like. In the United States, the federal government already owns a lot of land. And so that makes the 30% feel kind of achievable, although it's also of deep concern to um, indigenous governments, um, nations that are sovereign, um, that are surrounded by the United States, um, as well as um, federally unrecognized um, tribes and um, people who live in the Western United States on on and adjacent to um, federal land. And then... Um, the European Union recently passed a restoration law um, that is likely to go into effect that calls for countries to conserve or 
restore 30% of their land area. And it's interesting that their restoration is um, a piece of it as well, because restoration being a more capacious activity does allow for continued human use and human inhabitation, but um, with a an eye toward improving habitat for other species. So we're seeing this, um, and I, I do think that we will see other governments take up this idea as well. Um, there is UN funding behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, 2030 is rapidly approaching, though. I mean, like whether these things actually get implemented is another another um, story. But I think that there is both promise and peril in this excitement over this idea. The the peril is, you know, as we um, both briefly mentioned, the um, reality of human rights. Um, violations and the actual um, displacement of people for the protection of other species. Um, And I think related is, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, the way in which often reforestation in particular is framed as an alternative to reducing the combustion of fossil fuels. <laughs> so, and this is where my work on restoration intersects with um, this kind of apologist or band-aid approach to carbon policy, right? Because, and I, I myself am very critical of forest-based carbon offsetting, um, both because of the technical problems with it, um, you know, trees trees catch fire, trees die, that carbon is is re-released. Um, accounting for it is very difficult because mm-hmm. how do you say that a tree wouldn't have existed without mm-hmm. um, these policies? Um, but also for the narrative reasons that I think we should care about trees for reasons other than their carbon storage. And that the trees that are fastest and best at storing carbon are not necessarily the trees that are best habitat for the millions of other species on earth. And so then you get this pitting of um, the um, scholar, uh, environmental justice scholar, Michael Mendez calls this carbon myopia, where environmentalists are just focused on carbon accounting and not thinking about in his work, um, you know, not thinking about co-pollutants that are generated when fossil fuels are burned and the, um, exposure to toxic materials that um, primarily poor communities and black and brown communities are exposed to. Um, and also in my work, the um, you know the biodiversity side, where if you're just focused on carbon accounting, you're not thinking about you know what might these trees um, uh, do for other species and and what is it? the question very question like what is a tree and what is the purpose of a tree? Um, but we see this already with carbon, uh, with, with forestry based carbon offsetting plantations, where there was a 2011 Oxfam study that found that more than 10,000 people were kicked out of their homes in Uganda when one, uh, UK registered carbon offsetting, uh, NGO moved in and created a carbon offsetting plantation there. And so, and this is continuing, you know, that is one of many examples. And so there's a new, you know, in the 1990s, it was biodiversity conservation, and this was the justification for land grabs and kicking people out of their homes. And now the justification is the climate crisis. And so um, I'm not advocating for entirely throwing out reforestation. I do think that Reforestation is often cool and nice and good and good for other species. But I think we need to ask my my fundamental question is who gets to make these decisions and where is this work happening? Absolutely. Thank you for such an excellent um, overview of the problem. I think what is so 
curious about how we are approaching um, the ecological crises, the biodiversity crisis, the, the climate crisis, the crisis, the nature crisis, the eco crisis. Um, is this, it's still following, unsurprisingly, the same uh, lines of thinking that got us into this problem in the first place. So like the Cartesian split, you know, the dualism between like man and nature, like humankind is something else that is not a part of ecosystems. And then there's the the rest of the world that is for us to either take or manipulate or whatever. Um, and also that things only, because of that, things only serve a purpose according to how we relate to them, not just the fact that they exist um, as they are in relationship within ecosystems with everything else. So, I mean, the whole thing of like trees being seen as a technology to store and capture carbon, mm -hmm. it's like we're living in the matrix. It's like, I, I feel like offsetting is like one of the biggest scams of uh -huh. this century that has, you know, it's, it's like economic accounting tricks kind of, you know, uh, Having been played for so long in the financial markets and that being made so real, like the reification of financial relationships and then kind of extrapolated onto forests as if, as if it makes, it, it makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And the financialization of the crisis, the financialization of nature has never been helpful. Um, and viewing trees to serve one purpose rather than just valuing nature as well for what it is. To me, I'm also frightened of like the day that, say we figure out vaguely what to do this century, right? And say in a couple of centuries time, we figured out, we figure out a carbon capture technology. Um, you, goodbye. You can kiss goodbye to all the trees at that point because they won't serve their purpose anymore. You know, it's like, we don't need them to capture carbon, so we'll need them for something else. So it's just this, this very dominating relationship to, to, to everything. Um it's the same trap as trying the, um, you know, conservation biologists that have tried to put a price tag on nature, right, to be able to. And I don't yes. think that being able to say, like, this parakeet is equivalent to $50 actually does any work oh. to protect that parakeet. Because ultimately, any oh. anyone is going to be able to say, like, okay, well, I have $50. Like, I can compensate if, if things are fungible in this way. And I think that the, so in in my book, Wild by Design, I talk about the regulatory history behind the idea and practice of offsetting. And I argue that the, um, so I argue that carbon offsetting, so the idea that um, polluters in one place, that people burning fossil fuels in one place can pay to, to capture carbon in a separate place um, so you know, if we're talking, we're we we fit, we've just in case people um, listening don't don't know about this kind of scheme, we've been talking about uh, forestry based carbon offsetting. So this would be um, someone burning fossil fuels or company burning burning fossil fuels or someone buying a plane ticket. You know, I'm buying, I am um, traveling to Berlin next week, so I have a little box up, you know, that I can tick next to my plane ticket that says I'd like to offset my emissions from that flight. That money is then going to be used to plant trees in Uganda. Um, and so this idea that you can offset damage in one place through repair or carbon capture in a separate place, I'm very interested in what is the history of that thinking. And I argue in Wild mm -hmm. by Design that the model for carbon offsetting is wetlands offsetting, which is a neoliberal policy that began um, under... Bush Sr. and then Clinton in the United States in the 19, uh, the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, and began as a, 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 a deal brokered between the Walt Disney Company, the Nature Conservancy, and the state of Florida, where when Disney was expanding in the late 1980s, they were required under the U.S. Clean Water Act to compensate, they were paving over wetlands. And under the Clean Water Act, at the time, they were required to build wetlands in order to compensate for that. At the time, the regulatory practices that, that wet, those wetlands would have to be on site. 
And I go in deep into the details of this, but both ecologists, ecologists were unhappy with that because developers were developing these plantless puddles that didn't support any species. And developers were unhappy with it because it added cost and time to their projects. And so Disney proposed, what if we just give money to the Nature Conservancy to do work elsewhere in the state? Oh, wow. And this was the first, this was the kind of origin of the idea that you could sever the site of damage from the site of repair. And this becomes very explicitly the same people that kind of broker this arrangement then go to the UN and kind of engineer the Red Plus program the, um, and uh, the Global North kind of paying for um, reforestation in the Global South in order to kind of compensate for pollution. And so the carbon offsetting is modeled very directly off of this wetlands um, the offsetting. And the idea behind both is, as you said, this economic idea that places are fungible, that you can trade one place for another. Or even one species for another. If we look at the biodiversity framework uh, in the EU, um, they're proposing for their biodiversity credits, like for like, um, or like for like, or better. So, you know, you can, you're destroying flamingos in Spain, but you're paying to, you know, help out the bats in Greece and that's okay because they've been equated to have the same value using this framework. Mm -hmm. And so not only are we severing site of damage to site of repair, but we're completely severing the ecosystem, chopping it up into essentially these like substitutable parts of like biology, not even species anymore, not even species relative to a space, not even just a space, but chunked up units of biology that can be yeah swapped in and out because of this fungibility. Thank you so much. I had no idea about that um, Disney wetland story. That is fascinating because it was what the Kyoto Protocol where they introduced red at the at the COP. Um, mm-hmm. That was in 1991, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I'm aware of the time and I think it's probably good to get into restoration because we could and we could speak for hours about the, the problems of offsetting uh, preservation, conservation. And I think it's important to note, uh, even though I'm sure you will speak about it, but the main thing with conservation, like nature reserve parks in the United States, which were a fantastic piece of legislation put out by the, you know, I think it was a Republican government, um, people are not allowed (laughs) to live on nature reserves, typically. There's still this split, and that's why there's this fear, and that's why there's typically a lot of dispossession of indigenous peoples, or just poor people as well, on Mm -hmm. land that is then meant to be reserved purely for nature, because we forget that human beings are also part of nature's ecosystem, Um, and often not just part of it, but critical around the world to the health and well-being of of that ecosystem. So please talk to us a bit about how this collaboration with restoration and and how it's different and some of the projects that are going on around the world. Yeah, the reason that I, in my work, argue for moving away from preservation and toward restoration is that the very idea of preservation accepts the continuation of capitalist extraction, the continuation of damage. It is arguing that the only solution is to enclose and protect certain areas. And so then you're dividing the world Mm -hmm. into protected areas, cherished areas, and then sacrifice areas. And everything else just becomes a sacrifice area. So I'm, I'm interested in when you preserve a place, what are you doing to what are you saying about the value of the unprotected place, the places where people live and work? And so I think the promise of restoration is that restoration can happen everywhere. It can happen in lots of restoration work is done in protected uh, national parks and preserves, but restoration also happens when individual landowners plant pollinator gardens. It 
can happen when a company builds a green roof. It can happen at a former mining site when reclamation work is done and a a corporation or government decides to replant vegetation. And so I think there's um, what appeal of restoration is that it is not a spatial carve out. It is a, a approach that can be applied to any type of place. It is the goal of encouraging and helping other species to live in that place. And so I think that is one of the real promises of restoration. And I think the interesting thing about restoration is also that it is it is taking action. It is intervening. It is saying, like, we as humans are going to do labor to raise species and return them to the landscape or cultivate them on the landscape. This labor Mm -hmm. is often currently voluntary, volunteer labor, right? We could imagine a future in which it is compensated labor. And it is a way to, it's a way to reestablish relationships between people and particular species and it's an act of, it is an act of caring. It is an act of nurturing non-human life. Um, and it is a way of, I would say, atonement or repair to say, to acknowledge mm-hmm. the damage that has been done to non-human species um, and to the people that have that have had ongoing um, or historical relationships with those species um, to acknowledge those historical and ongoing harms and to actually do something about them. I think it's a, I mean, that's beautiful, everything that you've just said. And it sounds, it sounds true. It sounds correct. It sounds good. It feels good. One of the things that when you're talking was that I thought about was this awareness of of you know acknowledgement and taking responsibility accountability um and how actually so much of the policies that we need to go forward are rooted in accountability mm-hmm. and it is a big part of why they're not happening so like loss and damages at um at the cop uh conferences why the United States is the big belligerent bully that is really um, sort of rejecting loss and damages uh, or climate reparations, which is another way of putting it, when, i.e. the global north, these countries that are historically responsible for emissions, giving money to global south countries um, to acknowledge the damage, help them pay for climate mitigation, do their own energy transition, et cetera, et cetera. The United States, from what I've been told by campaigners, is so against it because they're terrified of being opened up for lawsuits mm-hmm. um, for the historical emissions and the damage that they have caused. And I mean, even thinking about, you know, how um, people of color are treated in Western liberal democracies or in particular the United States, where there has been recently an acknowledgement of slavery, but no attempt to pay uh, reparations for slavery, no real attempt either to lift the conditions um, that are still like the racist conditions that are still impacting uh, the descendants of people that were torn from their homes and deposited in a new land to be slave labor, these systemic injustices that are still ongoing. And so <sighs> it's so frightening and so like kind of morally reprehensible that this is this is the state of play today, that essentially to do what we need to do, we need we need to say sorry mm-hmm. and acknowledge that harm was done and that we can't go any further with that model. And yet the hubris or the fear or the um, uh, desire for continued domination stops these policies being implemented even when it comes to, you know, our fellow humans. Absolutely. And, and I, and there needs to be that, that, 
simultaneous, you know, reparations in the form of both acknowledgement and action, um, whether we're talking about mm-hmm. enslavement, whether um, and the ongoing um, ways in which racial oppression has morphed into other forms um, or whether we are talking about, um, you know, the extirpation of predatory species in North America, there needs to be simultaneous. And and I think it's really terrifying to see the um, way in which this is in the United States becoming a partisan issue. And there's been, um, Mm -hmm incredible retrenchment and pushback against um, the idea of even teaching children about these histories um, and Mm. efforts to to ban books, efforts to um, ban the idea of um, critical race theory, right? Like these, these just efforts, Mm. monumental efforts to avoid the political potential and world that could come from acknowledging historical and ongoing harms. And I do think that, yeah. I do hear though, you know, the work to separate people from nature um, is part of this obfuscation, um, part of this avoidance of um, addressing these intertwined harms and doing something about them. I completely agree. I mean, it's so easy to not think about the damage being done by industrial fossilized, fossilized, fossilized capitalism? Probably doesn't make sense. (laughs) Fossil fueled capitalism and neoliberalism when we are like scurrying around concrete cities and nature just exists as these kind of like aesthetic little um, interruptions, Um, you know, like the trees along a a sidewalk, a pavement or a park in the middle of a city. And it's this kind of, uh, these nice little breaks, but they, they, they don't actually exist within the landscape of anything else. I mean, even the fact that there's this like massive binary between at one moment you're on a street and the next minute you're in a park. Um, it's so easy to not think about how the, how cities are rot and mm-hmm. how the lives that we la- lead cause such damage. And I think it's, it's a very... <laughs> I was going to say it's a very deliberate ploy. I really am questioning the sort of um, capacity for most people in charge to think coherently. Um, but it's, it's but the result, that, say. Oh, yeah, yeah go on. A lot of environmental activism and, and scholarship really has f- had focused in the past few decades on getting people to see the ways in which cities are connected to the sites where the materials that enable life in cities are extracted. So the idea that there's all of these um, people and landscapes and species that are affected by extraction that are hidden in urban life. Um, Now I think we see with increasing attention to climate justice and climate change, the reverse of it's not only extraction that is affecting people, vulnerable people and environments, it is consumption as well. And the ways Mm. in which with the burning of fossil fuels, you get obviously the contribution of greenhouse gases to the global atmosphere, our shared atmosphere, uh, the air that we all breathe you also get the global Mm -hmm. transport of pollutants. And so a decision Mm -hmm. to burn fossil fuels in Ohio in the United States is a decision that affects um, Sami people in Northern Finland, where the pollutants from that coal, uh, let's say coal-fired electricity generator are being, are, coming out of atmospheric um, out of the atmosphere and being deposited. And so there is no 
saying, and I think, you know, it, it, we would say recently with climate change, with the Anthropocene, there's no saying that there's localized impact, but I actually think that's a, that, that has been the case for, for centuries, right? They, um, it is not, it is not, globalization did not happen in the 20th century. It has happened happened centuries earlier. Thinking about that global interconnectedness is, some activists and scholars argue that that is paralyzing, right? That that global scale makes it, that crosses all political boundaries, makes it impossible to um, assign responsibility for who has caused harm and who should rectify harm. But but we yeah. know, but we know <laughs> who, you know, does not if we look at nation states, that who the top emitters are, or if we look at individual corporations, yeah. who the top emitters are. Yeah, of course. Sorry, that's funny <laughs> to me. Like, oh, because of globalization and, you know, what? come on, we know, we know. We might not be able to say that exactly impacts this or whatever, but exactly. I mean, if you look at the historical... Who's burned the most crap? There you go. That's the people with the most responsibility, quite frankly. And also, who are the people that stopping the policies, like putting injunctions against the policies that are going to help us move away from burning crap? They're also guilty right now. It's not, it's not rocket science. Um, in fact, it's so simple that our teenagers are figuring it out um, and taking to the streets. So... Yeah, sorry, that's um, <clears throat> quite funny. I've just written down global interconnectedness, global interconnectedness paralyzing, question mark? But no, <laughs> I think it's exciting. I think this idea of there being a kind of um, a, a cause that all of humankind can get together against, maybe apart from the 0.1%, but that's kind of the problem. Um, <laughs> and uniting across, across borders to protect the very nature with which we live, not just um, upon which we survive but, mm -hmm. and depend on, but with which we live. I think that's so, so, so exciting. Um, and it seems to be kind of the movement that is happening, I think, across the world now increasingly. That's, that's what we're seeing. Um, and if there was anything that we needed to combat globalized, industrialized, fossil-fueled neoliberalism, it does have to be a movement of the 99% internationally um because if it's national they can just export the problem mm -hmm. elsewhere which is what they did during the 20th century right and it is what we see you know some of in the united states some of our strongest environmental laws like the uh, clean air act and the clean water act because they were a nas national level approach um and because of free trade agreements like it, it just exported um environmental toxins and environmental risks to other countries. And this is the great hope that we have with these COP conferences, that it's this international forum where decisions can be made like they were with the ozone layer and <laughs> chlorofodrocarbon CFCs. <laughs> um, you know, just, okay, we're going to ban them because they're causing harm and we, we need the ozone layer. Otherwise, you know, our the first dermal layer is going to peel off or something, you know, very dramatic and horrific like that. Like we have a precedent for the international community coming together and mm -hmm. national communities, you know, independently coming together and making decisions, putting forth legislation that is necessary. And it is astonishing and mind bending that that has not happened with the biggest existential threat that humankind has ever faced. It is. And I think there's a lot of promise in thinking in um, thinking about what made possible the global united response to the hole in the ozone layer. Um, and there were there were lots of different. And I think that mm, detractors say like, well, it's not equivalent because with CFCs, there was already in place a, an affordable uh, substitute material. It was a smaller, you know, it was the refriger refrigerant refrigeration industry that was primarily impacted. Whereas with fossil fuels, it is everyone and every industry that is impacted. Um, but there, I think, again, my field, environmental history, there's, there's such, I think the most important thing that I teach students is that um, 
the world has only been in a fossil fuel era for less than 100 years, right? And that only yeah. only a couple of generations ago, people lived in a world without plastic, a world without industrial yeah. biocides and pesticides. Um, and not to glorify the past. I mean, I don't, um, I'm not advocating for a, a return to that past, but I think that um, it's so telling that it's impossible to right now for so many people to imagine a world without fossil fuels, but it's a world that existed, that existed for millennia. Um, and it's one in which, um, you know, it's one that, that could exist again. Um, and I think, I think it's very telling that, you know, in my field, in thinking about restoration, there's, um, people who are interested in genetically engineering species so that they can better survive climate change, like engineering, there's, you know, work being done to try and, um, use CRISPR mm -hmm. technology and other genomic editing technologies to create coral that is, can survive in warmer water or more acidic water. And I think it's, it's wild that it is easier for people to imagine genetically modifying thousands of species than it is to imagine reducing fossil fuel combustion. Yep. 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 Thank you. Put that on t-shirts and send them to everyone. Oh it is mind boggling. It's another mind bending thing. I mean, I think it's related to this, the rise of productivity and the rise of like bullshit jobs to use David Graeber's term um, people existing within the con economy and, and doing within the economy, but completely disconnected from A, like the fruits of their labor and actually from results, if at all, because that's the whole notion of like this bullshit way of, of living. You're just given an excuse, <laughs> like capitalism gives you an excuse to live um, because we need to use up all this sort of like money and energy and everything that's kind of floating around. Um, I think that's why people find it so hard to imagine because what does it mean if I, if there's not a supermarket where I can go and get the things that I need in this kind of like bizarre adult infantilization, because I don't know how to grow my own food. You know, if there's not um, a nice restaurant that I can go to, cause I don't know how to cook my own food. If there's not a machine that can wash my clothes, cause I don't, I can't be arsed, you know, beating them with a stick or whatever. Like the, the, all of these old pieces of technology, it's not just that they um, are kind of obsolete in our world today. It's that we are not afforded the autonomy even to use them in a sense mm -hmm. um, because everything is happening so fast. And so the more that we are disempowered from the very action of like taking care of ourselves in a sense and thus being a member of our community and thus being a member of like a, a, of a natural ecosystem, I think that's why it's so difficult to imagine just going back a few generations like there are people, my grandmother is 93 and she remembers a, a very, very, very different world, one that we can talk about. And mm -hmm. still it's wild for my generation to think about that. And I genuinely believe it's not only a crisis of imagination that this kind of like modern industrialized neoliberalism has thrust upon us. There's some also connection to do with our autonomy and the choices that we ha that have been taken away from us with regards to how we live our lives and this feeling of being, there's a reason they call it the hamster wheel or the treadmill or the treadmill, you know, um, especially those of us who are graduating with an education and going straight into a job market that does not afford us any sense of, yeah, choice again. So uh, yeah, there's uh, that was that thought didn't quite end on the punchline. I was hoping it might, but <laughs> there's something in there. <laughs> no, and I think the severing of labor from creativity too, right? Um, <sighs> yeah, so much more. I wish I could talk for the next four hours <laughs> with you. I know, there's, I know. I know. We could, you know, I could, I could keep you for so long, but I'm aware we're, we've run over it. So listen, thank you so much for your time. My final question for you is who would you like to platform? I love this question. I would like to platform Sabrina Imler 
They are a science journalist and author of the book, How Far the Light Reaches, uh, Life in 10 Sea Creatures. And this is a book that I just taught in my Animals and Society class. Uh, it's a book that blends memoir and science journalism. And I think that Imbler's writing Lovely. on survival and their queer identity and care on a damaged planet opens up a lot of conversations about possibilities for the future, possibilities about the way that we live. And I really think that you you mentioned earlier the um, kind of tragedy of seeing trees or other species as just things that either we protect and don't use or we use in capitalism. And that Imbler is really doing the work of uniting perspectives from the sciences and the humanities to think about what we can do to address planetary crisis. Oh, what a wonderful recommendation. Laura, thank you so much. Thank you. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together. 